Welcome to another edition of the Deep Dive brought to you by Inside Texas Football, powered by InsideTexas.com. I'm Justin Wells, your host. I'm with Ian Boyd and Paul Waddlington, always with me on these deep dives. First off, please like and subscribe to the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. We're getting to 7,000 fast. Please help us out. And also uh, hit us up at InsideTexas.com. We're running a March Madness special, a dollar for a month, and, and it really is a great time. Spring ball has just started, and, and now we've got March Madness, which is something we'll have to talk about a little bit at the end of the show. But first, we're going to talk about the offensive line. Because going into the SEC, there are there's there's one guarantee. You better bring some big boys on that offensive line, or you're going to have a long, hard time on Saturdays. Let's start it off. First spring practice was yesterday. That, you know, got an idea, got to see a little bit of, of what these guys look like. But I think Paul had a really good question to open it up. Who is the best five? You know, who's going to be the best five guys that we think that they can trot out there for, for the offensive line in 2024? They have a lot of options. They have a lot of experience and they have a lot of young talent. And that that right there is a recipe for goodness. Paul, I'm, I'm going to start it off with you. Uh, let's go left or right. What, what are you thinking is the best five Texas can put out there in 2024? Well, we don't know. What, what I do know are the best three. And then I think go. the best five will be determined around that nucleus. So. Starting from left to right, uh, Kelvin Banks ain't going anywhere. And then I think you've got Jake Majors, who has secured his position, and he's incredibly experienced at center. Yeah. Uh, a polling center, by the way. A guy who's got a, a pretty good acumen at, at moving and, and blocking in zone, and also even just being a polar, which is great, which is really a great way to free up your run blocking schemes. And then finally, DJ Campbell. He really grew into the job after struggling early, uh, as he should. That's what young offensive linemen typically do. Calvin Banks are yeah. unusual for a reason, right? DJ Campbell has had a good offseason. He's going to have an even better uh, spring and then and then early summer. And then I think you're going to see a really good DJ Campbell that, Justin, you've mentioned. This is a guy who legitimately thinks he might be able to go pro after this season if he, if he tears it up. So that's your core three. The yeah. question now is, who replaces, starting from right, going inside, who replaces Christian Jones? Is it going to be big Cam Williams? Well, I think that's what the coaches would like. I think they'd like to get him started on his progression. Uh, I, look, he was he played some limited snaps last year, but in the snaps that I watched and charted, he is very, very powerful at the point of attack. Uh, but he needs to clean up his footwork. He needs to get a little uh, quicker. And he needs to be able to show that he can handle an island pass rush from a, a quality defensive end. So that's one in, integral part of determining the best five. The other part is Hayden Connor. Very experienced player. A lot of starts under his belt. Very good pass blocker at the guard position. Not up to par as a run blocker, frankly. He, he's just not very good, particularly at displacement. Um, he can occupy a guy for a while. But if that defensive lineman has a motor, and has some power, he's going to discard him and go chase the ball. And, and that is something that is a net negative on the Texas run game. Texas can do better than just hoping to tie at guard. Now, the argument for, for Hayden is that he is a very good pass blocker. He's an excellent yeah. pass protector at guard. Now, so the question is, given the awesome depth and some of the really talented young players at guard, might our best offensive line, if Cam Williams isn't up to speed, might it be Hayden Connor kicked out to right tackle and then either Cole Hudson or Nato Umiazulu starting at Hayden Connor's guard position? We don't know. And that's why we have a spring practice. And that's why we have a fall practice. And that's why they all compete. Uh, we're not going to anoint these guys. That's why Texas went to the playoffs last year, because they're not anointing anyone. You have to go earn your job. And you saw playing time increase and decrease for at a lot of positions over the course of the year. Offensive line, ideally, I know people say, well, rotate them if you got all this talent. Eh, you need to get starters. You need to have them win the job and they need to gel and all play together. So that is my soliloquy on our search for best five. Gentlemen, tear it apart. What do you think? I Let, let me... Um... Let me make a, a little bit of a defense of Hayden Connor. <laughs> <laughs> the big NASA. Yeah, he's, he's, I think what Paul said is accurate. I will say that uh, when he's pulling on counter, he's not 
super physical there. He's not really physical in general. It's basically the complaint. But uh, that it's really more about making good contact on those poles, and the targets are often pretty small. So if you like, if you play pass protector, then you tend to get the job done pretty well. They pulled him a ton last year, and he was he was good. He was also good when guys would try to adjust and get inside him. He would just ride him inside so the ball could spill outside. Hmm. Um, and he actually he's quick in general, and so he's good at reaching guys on outside zone. So when they block outside zone, he's actually not a negative, like maybe on duo or uh, inside zone or something where he needs to be physical and move a guy, like Paul was saying. Outside zone, if he beats, he'll beat a guy to a spot. <clears throat> and then he just has to kind of hold serve and tie. And he actually is pretty effective. And sometimes sometimes he's actually very effective when he gets that done. Um, so Ian, you're you're describing a phenomenon that I started calling a, a long time ago a screener rather than a driver. Yeah. And screeners can be effective. There are effective college offensive lines where every guy's a screener, and you you build out your entire run game around that. Right. It's about beating people to spots and sort of partitioning them off briefly so the back can get through quickly. Right. Texas has a different vision, and we've got guys like that. Jake Hamm. They've had a different vision in recent years, but by the end of the year last year, they were running a lot of outside zone and majors is very good at it. Campbell is very good at it. Banks is very good at it. So it's like, if they're all good at it and you have plenty of it in the playbook, they have, you know, a dozen iterations of outside zone in the playbook and he's good at counter. Then you have like two mainstay run schemes and a gazillion protections you can run off of it on play action. So I, to me, Hudson is clearly an all around better player than Connor, but I could see how they might think that Connor just is makes for an easy fit and guarantees that they can do all the things that they really want to major in. Yeah. I I think the appeal of the drive blocking, particularly inside is as you know, Ian, if a light box really can show up, in the play action game and the, and the inside zone, inside zone and that interaction, right? Or just power running duo. If, if you are physically superior inside and a team is really worried about your passing attack and they're playing an honest or even a light box, you can literally just hammer them downhill. Yeah. And Jaden Blue has proven actually great facility as an inside runner. Uh, he, he goes about it differently. He's not. It's not Earl Campbell in there, but. No. Uh, and, and I think CJ Baxter, as he grows into his body, still waiting for that to happen. Uh, we need we need to have that element in our run game. And I think one of the things that struck me about Michigan, and you can overstate, like, let's look at the national champion and build our program around them. Well, we can't duplicate some of the things they do because it's it's their identity. But the diversity of Michigan's run game was very striking to me. Their pass game was circa 1998. Uh, college football, but uh, you know, JJ McCarthy, you know, make a play, but uh, their run game was incredibly diverse. They zone, they man block, they, they did crazy pulls and they had all sorts of misdirection and, and guys moving around in different angles. And I think that there's something to be taken from that, that if you have really good backs and then you, more importantly, you've got really good receivers threatening you outside. So you can't load up the box. I think Texas has the ability to be a really dangerous running team and a, and, a, and a holistic running team if they can get a little bit more of a complete player at that guard position. That all said, pass blocking is the number one job. And that's a big change in the evolution of college football, right? You used to be able to get by with just a run blocking line and, and you'd play action to buy a little time on, on, on your pass game. But, you know, you can't give up easy internal pressure in college football in the modern passing game, particularly our passing game. So that is a huge leg up for Hayden Connor. And, and I think it's, it's a good position for Texas to be in and that he needs to get beat out for this to happen. It's yes. not just that you can tie him. Right. And then Cam Williams is sort of the other element. Hey, you talked about Cole Hudson being maybe the clear all around better player. What about Nato Omiyazolu? Isn't he the most athletic dude inside that we've got on the roster? 
Yes. Probably the most athletic. Yeah. Inside. Inside. Yes. Yes. I let, let me say one more thing for Hudson again to to bolster your point. Actually, before we talk about those guys, goal line. <clears throat> goal line is where you know Texas was weak last year, and Hudson makes a difference over yep. Connor. Um, yeah, N- Neto. I thought that like in the spring game last year, he didn't look very comfortable to me yet. Neither he nor Cam. Cam was really physical at guard in the spring game last year, but neither of them really looked very comfortable. So I figured that neither of them would end up um, breaking through. But Neto is, oof, I mean, it's kind of surprising to me that he hasn't repped any at tackle at Texas. So he must be really a plus athlete at guard. Um, we'll have to see like the spring, how far along he's come with, you know, the rudimentary dimensions of guard play. But I think Paul, I think Paul made a great point about you can't get beaten the pass pass blocking game, especially in this day and age. And with these two quarterbacks, when you have a Quinn Ewers and an Arch Manning, the impetus is going to be protect those guys. You're taking you're looking at two future NFL early draft picks, and so. Cam Williams, I think they want him. That's I, I don't want to say it's his job to lose, but I think that that's, that's exactly what it is. They want him to go and take it. They want him to get a little bit of his weight down. They want to get his protections a little bit more crisp. And they want to, you know, he he get he does get beat on the speed rush on times. And so I know they want to do that. Hayden Connor is is going to be the guy that if he can't, he could slide in there and do that. One guy we mentioned in pre-production was Trevor Goosby. Now, that's the redshirt freshman out of Melissa. He's he's the backup left tackle for Kelvin Banks. We kept hearing about Goosby last year because he was the one offensive lineman in that class that didn't come in the spring. He was the one guy that didn't enroll early, and he wound up being probably the one with the most upside. And you get to, we get to see him yesterday, and he looks fantastic. Everything we had heard and reported is accurate on that guy. This guy looks great, and so I think there's there's a, there's a there's a scenario where he could get some run at right tackle, even though he's the backup to Calvin Banks at left tackle right now. You mentioned Cole Hudson. Ideally, if this is going to be a pa- if if the pass blocking is going to be the most important, it almost feels like Hayden Connor has to be at right tackle early on, and Cole Hudson has to be at left guard. Not to mention Cole can also do different things. He can play center. He can play right guard. He's interchangeable, but. I, Ian, who do you think gives them the best chance to win the SEC at right tackle in 2024? Well, Cam Williams, I think. I mean, okay. he's just got the most up. His upside might be, you know, like early round draft pick eventually. Yeah. I don't think he's, I don't think he's there right now. Um, but like, man, get him comfortable at like 340, 330. I don't, I don't know exactly how. How low? I don't think he's been three thirty since ninth grade. Be, he's always going to be big, right? But um, I saw him dunk as a four hundred pounder. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. How, how much do you think he actually weighs now? Do you think 360? three sixty? Three sixty five. I'd okay. say 360, 360 ish range. I think Sadir's three seventy, and I think he's a, he's probably a, a couple buckets of chicken underneath Sadir, and so I'd say probably three sixty. I I think then like three fifty or less would be good. Yeah. That, I think cool. that's ideal. Um, you know who he reminds me of, Ian? Uh, he reminds me of that. Yes, that run of Oklahoma tackles like Phil Lodehole, who were yeah. just gigantic, not great pass protectors, but between their around. size. I mean, you couldn't bull rush them, right? And yeah. you had to run around them, which in and of itself gives you a little bit of time, right? And also they got pretty adept at holding and pretty, you know, the old Big 12 officiating just didn't really call it very often. So that might allow Phil Lodeholt to grow into the job and actually get better at pass protection. Now, ideally, we'd want him to become Trent Williams, but uh, Trent Williams is his own unicorn, his own beast. Uh, he's yeah. still the best tackle in, in probably the NFL. Uh, and he's, he's a, what, 12-year veteran now or something ridiculous. But yeah. uh, I, I think that's – I mean, his upside as a run blocker cannot be overstated. And when you have a guy out there at right tackle who can fold down an entire, like cave down an entire part of the defensive line, that cuts off all the backside pursuit, right? And if your tight end can get out on the smalls in space, 
Jaden Blue's going for 70, y'all. Like, it, <laughs> it creates a massive big play running game potential. And defenses are just – there's no – you don't have enough fingers to plug the holes in the dam, right? There's just leaks everywhere. And, and that's the big upside for Cam that's so bewitching is – so we just said pass protection is the most important thing. But if he's just good enough at pass protection and dominant at run blocking and just manhandling defensive ends, I mean, we're talking about, hey, guys, in the college game, a big defensive end weighs 265. He's 100 yeah. pounds heavier. And he's longer. It's, yeah. He's going to be making it's, first contact. <laughs> it, it, it's, the, it's, it's, it's the wingspan. It's the athleticism. It's all those things. Scary. You know, we, we think we know the best five, we think. And we know Cole Hudson is probably your – we, we think. We think. We probably don't, but let's pretend. We And we, we probably think that Cole Hudson – you know, in my opinion, Cole might be one of the best five. But if he's not, he's your sixth man. He's your first guy off the bench. He's, a, he's, he's versatile, and he can do a lot of different things. He's finally healthy. So I think Hudson's definitely the one. Who are a few guys you guys are paying attention to after that first five, after that first six, that first seven? Who are a couple of the guys that you want to hear more about in the spring? Ian, I would love to hear your t- thoughts on it, but I'm going with Paul first. <laughs> and the, the excitement of getting my hand up and the politeness of it overwhelmed Justin. He's ultimately <laughs> the man from East Texas. He respects politeness. So yes, sir. Uh, I want to know backup center. I know that's not sexy, but – Ian mentioned it. I wonder if Cole Hudson cross-trained as the number two center is also our best deal there as well. I don't know. Connor Robertson, I think, is is slated as the number two. Uh, and that's fine. I don't I, you know, Connor can progress and, and be a good player for us uh, down the road. I just want more opportunities to get Cole on the field or be prepared to get on the field if Jake Majors tweaks his ankle and we got to hold him out for two games. I, I want a guy in there. Who, who can move the line of scrimmage, who can, who also Cole's a smart guy and he's, he's engaged. He's in his playbook. He's a guy who could call that line and do it with authority. Right. So number two center actually is more interesting to me than you might think it might be. And I kind of hope Cole Hudson gets cross-trained there. And I he had done were, a little bit of that, by the way, he has done some of that center cross-training before. Go ahead, Ian. Yeah. I think he was the backup last year originally. And then he was injured by the time they got to Oklahoma, so it had to be Robertson. Right. Um, th- not only that, Paul, but Majors is gone for sure after this year. Yeah, it has to be. It's been six or seven years. <clears throat> right. So, so it's a that's like an, a big building block of next year is who slides in there, because um, you know only so many guys can do it, and if one of your better guys can do it, it just makes a big difference when you're building out the twenty five line. Um. Gooseby, I'm. In, I haven't watched him yet, so I'm curious to see him. He seems to be like the classic, like, um, you know, a lot of times, like the best tackles are the guys that come in undersized, and so their rating is a little low. Out. And then everyone's like, "Well, you know, who knows? They got to get bigger." And then Paul <laughs> like stabs himself in the head with a fork. Uh, so he came in at like 270 or something, 280. Yeah, and it's impossible for a 270 pound 16 year old to put on weight who's six foot six. It's just right. impossible. It's it's hard for a 16 year old to get stronger. It's impossible. Well, you just pray to the gods and hope that something magical happens. He's that's right. He's now like, he's up to three thirteen. <laughs> yeah, he's up to three thirteen. I mean, it's just classic. Like Sam Cosby was like that. Connor Williams was like that. Yeah. Um, it's just so common. Uh, late. I could. I don't need to list everybody that has ever matched that description. But uh, so I, I want to see him in action. I, I love the reports. I'd like to see where Neto is, and then Baker, Brandon Baker. I wonder. Um, I'd love to see him because when his high school film I thought was like awesome. Like I think he might be one of the better, to my eyes, prospects they've signed in the last three or four years. Like Banks, up there with Banks and with. Uh, uh Campbell. I mean, I just named the five stars, so kudos to my evaluation skills. But great job, Ian. Ta-da. Yeah. <laughs> he he really looks like a five star to me for sure. And uh I'm I'm also curious like what his play strength is like. If he could get on the field 
in uh, 2025 at guard. If because okay. like because even after they lose ta- Banks, tackle could still be loaded next year if Goosby is what we think he might be, and Cam Williams is great this year and he comes back for another year, which he probably would. And then you got Brandon Baker booking in both behind both of those guys. You could you could do that, or you could also just play him inside a guard and bump him out uh, if somebody gets hurt. If he can, you know, if he's if he's ready playbook wise to handle all that. So yeah, I'm, I'm Sark has definitely done that in the past, or just start a guy at guard to get him on the field and move him to tackle later. Um, yeah, those are the main ones I think that I'm curious to see. The guys that figure to be prominently involved in building a 25 line when they lose, you know three or four guys from this team. You know, we, we, we've got the, you know, last year there wasn't a lot of uh, freshmen making an impression. There were too many older guys, too many guys that came in and incumbents, things of that sort. This year there are two freshmen I want to talk about that they could see the field. Ideally they don't, but they could in, 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 in odder circumstances. And, and this is going a little bit deeper, but Daniel Cruz at center, you know, it was, Ian was talking about it earlier. Cole Hudson, to me, is the next center for next year, just because of his experience and his everything that he adds to it. Now, Daniel Cruz could have an incredible freshman year, get stronger. He's already a big kid. He's he is, he's pigeon-toed at center because that's what he's going to do. And then you've also got Brandon Baker, the five-star out of modern day, who is already you know showing some of his athleticism that a lot of these other guys don't have. Baker, there's a reason he's so highly touted. And so my, my question remains, this will be the last one uh, about the offensive line. You know, what's the worst case scenario where we have to see freshmen on the field or we have to see Trevor Gooseby playing? Is Or is that even a worst case scenario if Trevor Gooseby is getting starters type minutes? Because you have to think about these things. What was it? Six years ago, the running back room looked stocked. Two weeks later into fall camp, there's only one healthy scholarship back. Like ideal, what what's the best and worst case scenario from both you guys as we wrap up O line talk? I, the worst doesn't seem that bad to me. Like the worst would be, yeah, you lose Banks and there's just some ceiling that's just gone. But it feels like they could lose Banks, they could lose Majors. Uh, that maybe be like the two most damaging losses, and they just have a lot of athleticism and know how at snapping the ball now behind them. To where I just don't think they would crater. Um, I mean, if everyone gets injured, then they, <laughs> that's going to really hurt. But you just get in. That just is beyond the realm of likely. Right. Right. Paul, what do, you, what do you think about best case, Paul? Best case, I just think that Cam Williams sees his right tackle, has a yes. little bit of a rocky start. Uh, Michigan, that's going to be a challenge now early uh, for that offense in general. That people are trying to – the Michigan's losses are on offense. They are devastated on offense. On defense, on defense. they're going to be as good or better personnel-wise. I don't know if they're going to be as well coached. I don't know if they're going to be as well coached. But they are going to be a problem for people, including Texas. So, Cam Williams, we're going to learn some stuff about that young man in that game uh, because their defensive coordinator, their new defensive coordinator, is the most blitz-happy coordinator in the NFL. And it's also he sort of – coached himself out of the league over blitzing. Uh, and he, he, he had been – Martindale had been at the very top of the game for over a decade. And then he got he got a little too enamored of his own of his own shtick. So that'll be interesting. That's going to be a trial by fire. The, the best case, Cam Williams steps up. Yes. Hayden Connor either steps up and elevates or gets beaten out by Cole yes. Hudson. And we get – speaking of polling, Cole Hudson murders people in space on polls. I mean, we've, we've got – documentary evidence of this yeah. Calvin, banks, Calvin Banks is not completely plateaued guys he's still young he's still getting better uh, by the end of last season he was a dominant run blocker when before he'd been okay or above average as a run blocker he was murdering people uh, and then you could have a great progression from DJ Campbell which should be expected in fact so the upside is everyone levels up that we're already counting on and then some guys step up and you end up at the end of the year, Texas is the best offensive line or the top three offensive line in the country. And that is achievable. It's absolutely achievable if everybody steps up. Yeah. You know, another guy that I think would be great on the O-line is Andre the Lawyer. Anytime you're in trouble, he's going to protect you. He'll be your left tackle. He's got your backside. 
He's, a, he's, he's your blindside man. Andre the lawyer. Call him at 214-444-8808. He's located in Dallas, Texas. He helps everybody, including injured Longhorns, car wrecks, 18-wheeler accidents, on-the-job injuries, wrongful deaths. Andre the lawyer is the man. If you're ever in trouble, you're ever in a spot, that's the guy to protect you. Give him a call. Andre the lawyer, 214-444-8808. One more. We got we got a few minutes left, guys, and we, we, we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get to it. It's March Madness, and granted, Texas is a football school, and we love football off season and in, in in season. But Rodney Terry and those boys were ten minutes from a Final Four last year. Now I don't see that happening again at all. But crazier things have happened. Last night, Colorado State beat Virginia handedly. To, to, for that play-in game. And so now Texas faces Colorado State on Thursday. I believe it's Thursday in the evening. Paul and Ian, we were talking about it a little bit. What are your expectations there? And kind of Paul and I were talking about Virginia basketball and just uh, how how low that program has gone. Yeah, you had an amazing statistic, Justin, that Virginia – I don't want to bury it for you. Tell us – tell drop this fact on us. Yeah, you know, I'm a big Bennett guy. I have been, especially after they'd been knocked out as a one seed and he had basically had told his program, look, this is this is part of life. This is how you work. Since 2018, they have won six games in the NCAA tournament. It was every game in the 2019 season. They haven't won a tournament game before or since. That's a seven-year window. I mean, and you gotta you gotta think, how long does a guy keep his job? You want a natty, so you built up some collateral there, obviously, but you can't get out of the first round for the next five years. Like, guys, that's – Virginia got in on reputation alone, but I was blown away by just the – that – that you win a national title and then you can't win another first-round game in a seven-year window. That – that's – it's crazy. It's nuts. Yeah, hey – Three, four things, quick things. One, Ian was concerned about Texas playing Virginia, and Virginia plays an incredibly weird, contrarian, slowdown style that might affect us. Texas is at its most comfortable out and running, right? Run, run in, gun in, playing loose. Yeah. No worries about that. Virginia yeah. was as Virginia was terrible. I knew they were bad, and they're much worse than I thought. Uh, Colorado yeah. State had a great game plan for them. Tony Bennett is known for his defense. They spread them out. They put the ball on the court and not their point guard. The star of the Colorado State team through the year was their point guard, who really did nothing in this game. They spread it out, gave it to secondary ball handlers, and said, attack the rim. And so they have a guy named Joel Scott, who's a, this is the kind of guy you get in the Mountain West and in college basketball. That's why you got to love it. 6'7, about 225, 230, older, physically strong. He averages about 13 a game at 57% shooting. How? He's got a handle. And he's 6'7", 230, and he's strong. And he faces up on people, and he drives down to the basket and then has a little junk game in the paint, Justin. He's that dude at the rec league that scores with just nonsense, and then he puts his big booty in you and gets space and goes up and gets a layup. That's what they did. That's what Joel Scott did to them over and over and over. Colorado State does not have a traditional big. They don't have a post. They've got That's multiple really guys. <laughs> They've got, yeah, it's true. We've got a, so we've got a six-foot point guard at Colorado State who runs the show, and then a bunch of guys who are 6'6", six, 6'7", six, six, spreading out the court and driving to the basket. And then, of course, they'll flip it out for the open three. So it's almost a Euro style of basketball. Uh, they, despite what you saw holding Virginia to 42, that was about Virginia more than Colorado state. Colorado state does not defend very well if you're offensively gifted, <laughs> uh, but they got a great matchup and, and the, the margin of that game was 25 points. 25 points is getting your butt kicked in basketball. It did not fully express the degree to which Colorado state kicked their butt. Uh, it was they had 14 points at halftime, Virginia. They had 16 points at the 15 minute mark of the game. So it was just awful basketball. The ACC, by the way, might be secretly terrible. So something to consider uh, when you're filling out your brackets. I like this matchup. Vegas has Colorado State as a two point dog. That's a tremendous amount of respect for the Mountain West, who got six teams in the tournament. We guys, we saw San Diego State, a Mountain West team, play for the title last year. 
uh, playing a slowed down version of what Colorado State is. Older, mature, strong, physical guys spreading the court and attacking the basket. If Texas has a solution for that, whether it's our big boy inside or whether it's DeSue or even Dylan Mitchell protecting the rim. It's going to have to be Mitchell. Colorado State's going to have real trouble uh, getting those easy buckets. The main thing Texas needs to do is use its size, uh, but not in a static way. Use the so- use Dylan DeSue's size to get open three looks, to get open shots from 15 that Colorado State can't defend. You know, Joel Scott has a 22-inch vertical. He can't check this guy. Dylan DeSue can get his shot off when he wants. And then when Texas can run, Texas needs to run. Put the pedal to the metal. Get Dylan Mitchell putting on a little dunk clinic. Get guys like Hunter who have frustrating. Hit and miss. Whoa, uh, hit and miss. But the way to get him comfortable is to get the tempo up a little bit. So yeah. anyway, that's my my two cents. Uh, I'll, I'll throw it to you guys. Yeah, I got. I have a couple thoughts that I'd love to hear. Oh, well, hold on, hold on. Hold on, Ian's got some basketball takes. Okay. <laughs> all right, um, let me get my seat belt. First of all, Kyrie Irving. No, we won't go there. Um, yeah, you don't want to – hey, Ian, don't lose all your credibility in five seconds. I, glorified sixth man. Uh, <laughs> so here's the thing I see with Texas. BYU brought that same style to the Big 12 this year. Uh, you know, spread, pick, and roll. Tons of big, versatile guys playing outside in. And they gave Texas fits when I watched them play Texas. They gave some other teams problems too. So I don't know if that bodes well for Texas versus Colorado State. Although at least they've seen it. And they know they know the vulnerabilities. Um, what I've observed about Texas, and people that have actually watched more Texas basketball this year than I have can correct me, but to me, this team seems way better when it's a – how do you say that guy's name? Abe Smith? Amos. Amos or Hunter. And then like Weaver, Cunningham, Mitchell, and then one of the bigs. And then they are long and athletic, covering up all your perimeter guys. Yeah. They get steals. They get out in transition. Weaver is dangerous in transition. Obviously, we- Mitchell Weaver is a tremendous on-ball defender. Like – Gocious Ball Bay style stuff, like Royal Ivy esque. Like Weaver is, I didn't realize how good of a defender he was. When they have Hunter and and, and Abe Miss on the on the floor at the same time, I don't think they're as good. I don't think they complement each other very well. Good point. Um, especially like Abe Miss is be, is best with the ball, and Hunter is not really a catch and shoot guy. He's better when he has the ball. Yeah, it's, it, you get kind of a you get kind of a Luca Kyrie effect. Where it's like these guys would both be best when they had the ball in their hands, and you know neither of them is going to play any defense. No. So it'd be better for Texas if I think if they switch that lineup, and uh, <clears throat> I don't know if they're going to do that. So they might. It ties into what Paul's talking about. Weaver is is part of that offense that goes. You just go because he's so explosive and so athletic, and 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 it's going to be interesting. Hey, Texas basketball is in the big dance. Listen. If they win a couple games here, if they win the first round and the team beside them wins their first game, we're talking about a Rick Barnes Texas rematch in round two with Tennessee. Um, I, I, I think that makes for outstanding content and outstanding YouTubing. And it'll be good to watch. It'll be good. It'll be good for everybody. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us on this edition of the Deep Dive. Thank you so much, Ian Boyd and Paul Waddlington, always bringing it on the football side. Paul bringing some basketball stuff for us today as well. Ian attempting to. It was beautiful. Please like and subscribe to Inside Texas Football YouTube channel. Come see us at InsideTexas.com. We got a ton more hot takes. You just got to come see it. It's a dollar for a month. Come hang out with us. We do appreciate you from uh, appreciate you guys for making us a part of your day. And thank you for being with us on the Inside Texas Football YouTube channel powered by InsideTexas.com.